Support for this podcast is provided by Avalara. Since 2004, Avalara's vision has been to harness the power of cloud technology to help simplify sales tax for businesses of all sizes. Collecting tax for the government is something businesses just have to do. But getting the job done efficiently and correctly can be an incredible challenge because tax rules and regulations can be endlessly complicated. It's an overwhelming task that begs for automation. So Avalara built a cloud-based solution that helps ease this burden, and Avalara scales up with its customers as they grow. With more than 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point-of-sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash tax notes. That's avalara.com slash tax notes. Avalara, tax compliance done right. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, the new face of Fisk. Tax is having a moment. Policymakers and world leaders are increasingly turning to tax policy as one way of tackling today's challenges, from the coronavirus pandemic to climate change. One of the new faces at the forefront of international tax is Paul Tang, a Dutch member of the European Parliament. Last September, he became chair of the Subcommittee on Taxation, also called FISC. Tax Notes reporter Sarah Piaz recently spoke with Tang about the challenges in international tax today and his hopes for the future. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. It's good to be here. Now, before we get to your interview, can you tell us a bit about Paul Tang's background, who he is, and how he came to lead the FISC? Well, Paul Tang started out as an economist, and he made his first foray into politics in 2006 as a member of the Dutch Parliament. In 2014, he landed in the European Parliament, and he started advocating for reform of the EU's tax system. Now, he maintains that the EU should hold member states to the same tax standards as it holds other countries, and he hasn't shied away from naming his own home country, the Netherlands, a tax haven. For many, that made him a natural choice to lead FISC. All right. Can you give listeners a preview of what you two talked about? Well, we covered how Mr. Tang plans to use FISC as a tool to educate national parliaments on combating tax avoidance and tax evasion. And we also talked about the ongoing battle among EU leaders over new own resources. These are these new taxes and levies the EU wants to approve to fund its 1.8 trillion euro coronavirus recovery package and long-term budget. And we spent some time unpacking the issues with the EU blacklist for non-cooperative jurisdictions. It's a controversial tool that the EU uses to promote tax good governance worldwide. All right, let's go to that interview. Welcome, Mr. Tang, to the podcast. It is so good to have you here. Yeah, well, good to be here. Great. So before we start, I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you first get involved in European tax policy? And how did you become the chair of the European Parliament's first ever permanent subcommittee on taxation, which is otherwise known as FISC? I have a big smile on my face, but that's because it's, I'm not sure it's a short story. So my introduction into, let's say, fiscal matters is as an economist. I've done my PhD, I started working for the CPB, which is called Central Planning Bureaus, which was initiated by Jan Thierberg, a Nobel Prize winner. And I had the time to, to do research, but also intellectually develop myself. And I was very well aware of the race to the bottom that was ongoing already then, when I moved from policy analysis to politics, it's quite a change, but I started in the, the, the National Parliament in 2007. But I'd seen in my research years, the, the marginal rates on the corporate taxes were declining at a rapid pace, that it wasn't the type of tax competition that was beneficial for investment and economic growth. And at that point that I started, of course, I was not fully aware of all the complexities and details that there are, that we have in the fiscal world and the fiscal systems. And it's a good thing that, that you don't know all the complexities from the start. I started my political life in the national parliament, also being responsible spokesperson for financial and fiscal affairs. Very much with the idea that this had to change. And at that time in 2007, I was probably a lone voice in a country which 
took almost pride in having a very competitive tax system and all the lobbying around it. Uh, but then already you could see there was a disconnect between the world of fiscal advisors, who saw no problem in advising a zero tax rate for a corporation, and politics. Because also in the Dutch parliament, no one would make the claim, none of the politicians, no matter what political color, would make the claim that it was good to have a fair share of zero. A fair share was something they needed to contribute. Already then you sort of disconnect. Of course, the crisis never was a good crisis, and now we have two of them. First, uh, the, the great financial crisis, and now the, the COVID pandemic. And that changed very much the debate. So I may have remained a lone voice, but it's, I think fairness has become more prominent on the agenda as a result of these, uh, these two crises. And when I came back into the, in the European Parliament in 2014, the first thing I did is I want to work on this again. I did it in national parliament. Of course, I had to overcome some perception, the perception that when you are Dutch, you are in favor of your Dutch, the Dutch tax system. So I had first to convince my own colleagues in the social democratic group uh, that I really wanted to work on this. And I also had to convince others in the European Parliament. But in fact, I was the leading uh, member of European Parliament on files like the, the, the CCCTB. On the DST, uh, I hope you all, your listeners now all know what this means, and a consolidated corporate tax base and a digital service tax. But I also was leading in, well, naming and shaming. So I was lead, uh, I took the initiative that European Parliament made very clear there are EU tax havens, including the Netherlands. And ever since, in my own country, the Netherlands, people think of them, uh, think of the Netherlands as, as a tax haven. Of course, at the same time in the European Parliament, that started with Lux Leaks, was followed by Paradise Papers, Panama Papers. So they also saw the dynamic. So it was not just the great financial crisis, but also the revelations that we had from uh, you know, often good journalistic work or uh, whistleblowers. That led to the, the subcommittee on uh, fiscal affairs. took some time to establish because you need political agreements, but uh, now it's here and, and I was, uh, well, I'd like to think of because of my track record in the, in the earlier years elected as the chair of the fiscal committee. I've been working on this issue for quite some time. And and in that sense, it's also interesting to see the changes over time. So it's, of course, it's sometimes a slow process and you can't go into politics if you're not by nature an optimist. But I have every reason to be optimistic, really, because I see the changes and I expect more changes to come. There will be a, a huge demand for fair taxation and also for more transparency. And you can say a lot about the tax world, but it's not transparent, and it's not fair. So there, we're bound to have some changes. Yes, it's really interesting that you bring up the public perception, how it's changed over the years. So I wanted to ask you just right off the bat, you know, in your short time as the European Parliament's FISC chair, FISC covered so many different topics. And, you know, it's only been a few months ranging from, you know, Brexit's impact on fair taxation to tax tools for countering harmful tax practices. So considering the urgency, you know, as you said, of the coronavirus recovery effort in Europe, what are your goals for FISC this year and how do you hope to achieve them along with your colleagues? Yeah, I think we cover quite some ground, and this is also why the European Parliament can play an, uh, an important role. People that are familiar with the situation with the European Union know that the competences are at the level of the member states, that they make decisions on the basis of unanimity, and at the same time, the European Parliament can play a role. The reason is we are better informed, dig deeper than the national parliament. For national parliament, this is a topic which is, they understand the important, but it's is far away, it's in the back rooms of Brussels, or nowadays it's in the back rooms of a Zoom meeting, meaning that the national parliaments are not on top and the European Parliament is. And I think that's a great strength. And I very much like to develop this committee as a European hub for discussion of, of, of tax matters. We need to crack open the back rooms. In fact, so it's what tax notes also do. You try to explain the world, right? And this is what we need. So it's not just country by country, it's more about transparency on what happens on the size of corporates. And I think transparency is a powerful tool for change because many of the, the current tax policies can't send the light of day. Just send the light of it. Just show it. See if, if, if people agree with, uh, with this. Probably not, but okay. And the same is true with decision-making on tax matters. I think it's very close to the heart because people have a very strong feeling of uh, taking the notion of fairness. And that is pretty simple. That's brought throughout the political spectrum. I just already mentioned it. Everyone has to pay its share. 
right? You don't have to be a loony left like I am to think that. And that's why I think we can also have a broad consensus on this. But the decision making is still very much, so it's an important, but decision making is still very much behind closed doors. And uh, what we try to do with the FIS committee is to break this open, to make the debate public. So that's that's one thing that we need to do. One thing that we need to bring also what I try to do, I'm, I've been a member of national parliament, I'm now a member of European parliament, but I want also to strengthen the position of national parliaments. They must understand the role they can play and they currently can't play because they are not as well informed and because they coordinate among each other. Uh, so we need to reinforce the, the democratic scrutiny of tax policy. Like I said, we want to be the European hub, but to crack open the back rooms where the dealing takes place. So that is sort of the institutional role that I would like the, the FIS committee to have. Then, of course, you do that for a purpose. Transparency is important. Now we have the country by country reporting on the table. But we also have a lot of well reforms coming up. Digital taxation is one of them. Digital taxation between code because it's not confined to digital companies, right? But very much linked to the OECD negotiations on uh, Pillar 1, Pillar 2, where's the minimum effective tax rate. The greening of the tax system will be on the, on the agenda. So we, we are in a period, and I expect that to happen in, let's say, more in the, in, at the end of the first half of this year or the second half of this year, where we, uh, where we can see uh, major changes. And, and before I forget, what we, what I very much hope, what we, the European Parliament is pushing for, and we'll also push, the Fiscal Commission will push for by studying this and coming up with their own position is the tackling of tax avoidance, right? I come from a country that I think is a tax haven, and I think that should change. I must say, but I already warned the, the listeners, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm optimistic, but I see a change on the going in the Netherlands, right? So that they are changing position also. But we need the outside pressure again to complete this change. So I very much hope that we will have measures aimed at aggressive tax planning that is distorting the internal market in Europe. That could be a very base for majority voting in the European Union to come forward as well. So I see a lot of changes and then I haven't touched on some which now seem may seem far-fetched, but I don't think are far-fetched. I see the huge inequality in wealth and in tax affordance of wealth, the inequality is so staggering. And I think this will be an issue as well. Because remember, we're going to a time, we're now still in the middle of the pandemic, where you see a huge imbalance in the in the public sector. We have high, uh, high expenditure support for firms, sometimes the same firms that avoid taxes. And on the other hand, uh, little revenue. So we need to rebalance at one point. Now, this time around, after the great financial crisis in 2010, we saw 2011, we saw cutbacks and proposals for reforms. Also, the ECB raising the interest rate. I think this time will be different, that it, we can't go back to a policy of austerity and reforms. So I very much expect that there will also be a policy that aims to raise revenue. And what better place to start with? The big corporates that do not pay their fair share, the big polluters, and the, and the very wealthy. So this is why I expect also this will come you know, within reach, which doesn't seem very likely now, right? But I think we are in a uh, very interesting period. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you brought up tax avoidance because that is my next question. I think that's, again, that's something, you know, that you bring up a lot during FISC meetings that really gets brought up a lot in the European Parliament. And, and just a note for our listeners, it is true that the European Parliament is only able to consult on tax matters, correct? You have more of an advisory role, I guess you would say. Yeah, that's true. But this is why we by being better informed than uh, by, by digging deep, I still believe, uh, and I, st I know that's true, that by, by feeding information into the public debate, you will change the public debate. Besides, but like I said, so public awareness is growing and this will lead to political action. That's what I have in mind. And this is why I also want to be very much in touch with national parliaments. We need to bring debate. We should not keep the debate in Brussels, but very much move it to the capitals. Because their their decisions also made. So this is why I like to be a European hub. If we can, if we could bring part of the work of the fiscal committee to the capitals, I think that's already the enrichment of the debate. But it will also increase public awareness and raise public pressure for change. Absolutely. So on on that note, you know, though you went through a, a variety of topics that Fisk is both focusing on and going to focus on in the next year you know, this overarching theme of tax avoidance keeps coming back, especially within EU member states. 
So I was wondering, you know, how could Fisk help the EU hold member states accountable for harmful tax practices within their own borders? The unique position of the European Parliament nowadays is that we are the only European institute that dares to criticize the individual member states. So that's an important role. Like I said, I, I, I've worked very hard on that in the last period, mandate we call that in Europe, so up to 2019. And now I want to go a step further and have these countries very closely considered. And of course, we're discussing here, apart from the Netherlands, which is obvious, but also Ireland and Luxembourg, but also Malta and Cyprus, have them in the spotlight and see and also come up with proposals what they can do to change and to show what impact they have. So these are European partners, right? And I always say to my compatriots, will we allow, be enabled that these uh, European partners are being robbed? Because the money that flows through the Netherlands comes from Germany and France. They miss the tax revenue because these are the countries with the highest marginal statutory uh, corporate tax rate. So we steal from our neighbors. That's what we do. And once people start to be aware of that, like I said, public awareness leads also to political pressure. At the same time, uh, you need to look and to uh, come up with specific proposals. I think uh, you can have as a European coordination why not look into the patent boxes, for example, which is a form of competition, which is completely ineffective. Uh, but you can also look into very country-specific measures. That's what I'm doing right now for the Netherlands. We are in the run-up of an election on March 17. So what I've done is, together with uh, many NGOs, is uh, organize a campaign that the Netherlands should no longer be a tax haven, but also put forward very specific proposals, what the politics, Dutch politics should do to indeed to be in line with the international community. And this is what I would like to do as well. So you try to develop pressure from the European Parliament with the help of the national politicians and, and organizations to change the, also the national debate. And speaking of pressure, so the European Parliament, you know, has managed to keep this pressure on both the EU Council and the European Commission to enhance member state screening processes in relation to the EU blacklist for non-cooperative jurisdictions in tax. We've talked a lot about this. Um, this has come up a lot in FISC meetings. But besides the European Parliament resolution that came about earlier this month, demanding transparency from the Code of Conduct Group and calling for new black listing criteria. What other efforts is the European Parliament and specifically the Fisk Committee planning to force more transparency and action from the Council on this topic of blacklisting countries? That's a very good point. In fact, we are, as the European Parliament, like I said, this is to break open the back rooms, right? Uh, the Council has these meetings and doesn't feel the need to be held accountable. So that's the problem we have uh, as European Parliament. We try to break open the situation and we need to find find ways of doing that. First of all, it's public pressure, right? Like I said, at the end of the day, there are politicians responsible and they feel public pressure. But we also try to find, let's say, legal ways of doing it. I know that Sven Kiekold is now involved in Fiscalis and DAC7. Uh, sorry, these are files. And we try to use this to improve our position vis-a-vis -vis the council. I'm involved now in securitization where I try to where we have also included the black and the gray list. Uh, and now the council is arguing, well, the gray list shouldn't be part of it. And so we have the discussion. And what I try to do, okay, if you want this change, it's fine, but then let's have an open discussion on how to deal with the black and gray list from now on. So trying to force them in a position they can no longer afford us. But it is, of course, institutionally, it's also an institutional fight. I won't bore the, the, the listeners to death with that, but it's an, a partly an institutional fight, but we will, we will get there. I have no doubt. We will find a way. What is something that you would like to see in the development of the blacklist? You know, because it's been criticized for, you know, the things that you mentioned, this lack of transparency within the code of conduct group, but also, you know, that some of the listing criteria is applied inconsistently and that, you know, the blacklist doesn't apply to countries within the EU that you would consider tax havens. So what is, you know, something that you think might be able to change that or maybe make it more fair across the board? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a long list. Let's let's be clear. I think the blacklist is potentially a very important instrument to set the rules of the game, right? So uh, the EU engages with other countries, jurisdictions, and but we try to set the rules of the game. So that in itself is a potentially very forceful, a powerful instrument. 
of course the council f up that's a pity but sorry this is not, not what you say in parliament right but but it is true <laughs> this is very good instrument but they, they throw it out of the window so what you would like to do is, and like I said, things will change. Don't worry. Uh, it will take time and it will take pressure, and, but it will change. So now we have the criteria are insufficient. For example, the Cayman Island doesn't even have a corporate tax system. And then you meet the minister from the Cayman Islands explaining that it's a perfect place for banks for many reasons, but that mentions that we don't have a corporate tax system. Of course, this is the reason why Cayman Islands attracting a lot of investment on paper. Uh, so you should change the criteria. But at this stage, you need also to maybe be consistent in applying this criteria. We had the discussion. I am now involved with Australia because of the SDS, the securitization file, because Australia is on the gray list. They have this offshore banking regime. This is a detail in the tax system, but they are on the gray list. And we have tried to have now this gray list in the legislation. So this blocking this offshore banking regime in Australia. And of course, Australia objects to it. And it gets away with it, at least not in the European Parliament, but with, uh, with, uh, with the Council. So they remain on the grey list, whereas they have done nothing to have it changed. So you need to apply it. And of course, the other example in this case is, is Turkey, uh, where you see, of course, the political pressure, but we now pay in terms of tax avoidance for to Turkey. So you need to apply the criteria consistently. The criteria are political, I would say, but the, the follow-up, the, the enforcement of the list should not be political. So this is, then you set the rules of the game. And of course, you would like to have defensive measure, countermeasures once countries are on the blacklist. That should be more clear. So you can develop the instrument to a great deal and you can, in this way, change the rules of the game. And I think that I would say the European Union is an economic powerhouse, but a political dwarf. We don't set the rules of the game in this world, whereas we have every reason to, to do so, especially when we make the, the system more fair. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California, Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. If you're hearing this, you're clearly interested in taxes, and you might benefit from checking out our sponsor, or you might know someone who will. The UC Irvine Law School offers a one-year, full-time program that's been ranked the number one graduate tax program on the West Coast. Students can expect a unique academic experience that combines in-depth doctrinal work and practical perspective to prepare students for successful careers in tax law. The small student-to-faculty ratio also ensures that students get the attention they need to succeed. Applications are open now. For non-U.S. applications, the deadline is April 1st, 2021. For U.S.-based students, the deadline is July 1st. To apply today, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. Switching gears a little bit, the EU has made commitments to introduce new own resources, these new EU-wide taxes and revenue streams to fund its 750 billion euro coronavirus recovery package, and also separately the multi-annual financial framework, the long-term budget. So, you know, I know this is maybe speculating a little bit, but what own resources proposals do you think that we're likely to see this year? And do you think that FISC will contribute to this debate at all and how? And then the second part of my question, how might an agreement, an international agreement at the OECD level on a plan to reform the global tax rules affect the EU's efforts to fund the recovery? I'll just start with the letter, of course, this half year is, you can see that the European Commission is cautious. And the reason is twofold. First, we have the Recovery and Resilience Fund, and it needs to be ratified by national parliaments. So this is maybe not the time, I think, to address the tax avoidance in Luxembourg and the Netherlands, in all fairness. So that makes the European Commission cautious. The other reason why uh, the European Commission is cautious, because we have the OECD negotiations. And I think many people, including myself, think it's worthwhile to make sure that we complete the OECD process. Not that the outcome will be perfect, but certainly there, there will be steps, uh, great steps forward. And this also conditions the, the proposals you get from the European Union. If you, the European Union does a proposal, the European Parliament will come with a proposal. Uh, for example, in the European Parliament, there will be this discussion on digital taxation. Uh, between quotes, right? Digital taxation is just a short for a more complex system. Uh, the European Parliament, the Fiscal Committee, will be the first to come forward with a form of proposal. But it's always in mind that it should help to make the OECD process 
the BEPS to success and putting pressure on the international process. So that conditions the Commission and Parliament at this stage. But already the European government leaders already conceded, already mentioned the possibility of a digital levy as a form of own resource. It doesn't complete a political fight because there are well, at least some member states, including the Netherlands, by the way, but also Sweden and Denmark, who very much dislike the idea of own resources. So there will be a, then, a, of course, again, a political fight within the union as to whether we should have, the European Union should have digital uh, own resources. But digital levy is certainly one of the candidates. The other obvious candidate is, of course, comes from the greening of the tax system or the greening of our incentive system, because it also includes the trade in emission allowances and the revenue from a carbon border adjustment that comes along with that. And that's also a very good candidate for, for funding the EU budget. Now, of course, the European Parliament is very much in favor of having its own resources. And that's not because we want to spend money. Yes, some of my colleagues do, that most definitely. But also because it helps to make the debate more democratic, I think. So you have uh, no taxation without representation, but I also think it refers us to no representation without taxation. If you have a full-fledged democratic processing, you need to have the right to tax so that you have a good debate and, and you need a balancing between, uh, between revenue and expenditure. So I think it very much helps to increase the legitimacy of the democratic debate in the European Parliament. So the European Parliament is generally in favor of uh, their resources, but it boils down, of course, to the discussion we will have among the member states, and that won't be easy. Then again, there are member states against, or you could say even that against, own resources. Uh, but there are many, many member states that are willing to take this step and now have an extra reason, because they fear that the, the cost of the recovering the resilience funds will come at the expense of the ordinary budget. So they very much look forward. So... They fear that, let's say, the burden, the interest and redemption that we have from the fund will, in the end, come from the ordinary budget. And they are the net receivers. So the, you will see also a distinction between net payers and net receivers in the European Union. And this is a discussion on that, that that should come, that will come. Yeah, absolutely. And to circle back to the digital taxation, and which you said is more like a blanket term for reforming the entire international tax system. The European Parliament, the Econ Committee, and FISC had a discussion about the report, the draft report on digital taxation that just occurred yesterday. So I wanted to ask, what is the purpose of this report and how does the European Parliament hope to use the report to apply pressure to European governing bodies? Yeah, well, that depends maybe on your political view, right? So that's also a political discussion. Personally, I think it would be good if the European Parliament, but this is, that's why I say this is not me as chair of the fiscal committee, but me as a social democrat. I think that it would be good that uh, the European Parliament also backs the national uh, initiatives. We have seen quite a few. They will put the pressure very much, just like the European Union can put a lot of pressure on the OECD negotiations. In fact, I was rapporteur on the DST file and I didn't come to an agreement. So it wasn't really pushed to the end, but didn't come to agreement, but it had the effect of bringing, bringing the U.S. back to the negotiation table and, and start restarting BEPS too. So when you see that a country or countries start to have this form of digital taxation, and that's like a short, that, that will push also, uh, will also help the international negotiations. So I very much, for example, hope that the European Parliament will also support the nationals uh, and make clear at the same time that we need, if we want to have an international solution, that we should ready to have, be ready to have plan B. And that is a European tax, and if not a European uh, digital tax, it should be a variety of national digital taxes, because this is the way to put pressure on the international negotiation. Because you know what will happen? Of course, the big tech doesn't like to pay taxes, just like any other ordinary company. Corporates don't like to pay taxes. So okay, I understand that. But to pay different taxes in different uh, in different countries makes life even more complicated. So that's, that will certainly weaken their, their opposition to this type of taxation. Yes, and, and that's definitely come up in the discussion, it seems, at the EU level about this backup plan. Well, really, it could be used as a tool to place pressure on some of these companies and the international discussion. So glad you brought that up. So I wanted to come back to something that you had mentioned before, the country-by-country country reporting, um, because I think you're right that that's a very exciting development. 
as you said, right now we're seeing movement in the council driven by the Portuguese presidency on the public country by country reporting proposal for the first time, really the first time in over a year, but actually more like four or five years. So what do you make of this? How likely are we to see agreement on this CBC reporting proposal this year? And what would that mean for tax transparency and fighting tax avoidance? Well, over the years, like I said, I've been doing this for quite some time, and I've started to appreciate the power of uh, of transparency. And in fact, if you think about it, much of the work of the European Parliament has been driven by, let's say, accidents of transparency, lux leaks, and so on. So uh, transparency is very powerful. And well, I hope now, but I've just seen the results, right? So maybe I'm too optimistic on this, but I very much hope now that the Council will come to a position that we will start negotiation between on the one hand, the Council and the European Parliament, and that will lead to a result. Let's face it, the extraction industry and the banking industry already have country-by-country reporting. So the idea that it's not feasible or that it will hurt the competitiveness of companies, it's, it's well, that has been proven wrong. We already have it. Now we can apply it. It can be crucially important. I'll give you an example. Let's say Shell, the oil company, Dutch-British. I've been challenging Shell for years that they didn't pay corporate income tax in the Netherlands. Well, I was not successful in that. They were not sort of provoked by me, but not too long ago, they admitted in uh, in the national parliament they don't pay taxes, corporate income taxes in the Netherlands. Immediately, there was a proposal to change the law so that also the Shell oil company will pay its taxes in the Netherlands. And this is the, the power uh, that you derive from transparency. So in my mind, it's it's very important. I must also say that part of the corporates is become is more progressive than politics. Right? So there are already some companies, Vodafone comes to mind, that apply country by country reporting. There's a GRI template is available, which I studied, which I think is very good. And you see uh, already companies embracing the GRI template. So because this is the interesting part that I also see among the corporates, they are concerned about the public debate on tax avoidance. They think it's poisonous, and it is for them, it is. So part of the corporates is willing to break from this uh, debate and, okay. And if you want to break from this debate, you need to change your, your, your policy, but to win the trust, you also need to be transparent what your policy is. So transparency is crucial for this change. So transparency brings change, but transparency can also bring the trust back. And, and this is more and more corporates are starting to see that the base tax avoidance is poisonous for them and it just hurts their, uh, let's say, their working environment. I also wanted to go back to something else that you brought up before this greening of the budget. So Commission President von der Leyen has said that the recovery will be green and it will be digital. And I think we've covered digital pretty well, but how do you see tax policy being utilized in achieving a green recovery? So in particular, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but what are the chances of seeing a carbon border adjustment tax and an expanded EU emissions trading system, you know, within the next year, like the commission has, you know, said that they will propose? I told you about my research day, and uh, in those days, we're already doing some we run models to find out what the impact would be of an emission trading system and, and also including a carbon border adjustment mechanism, by the way. So the ideas are already long available. What we need to do is to come to workable systems. This especially applies to uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I think the commission has to has to come up on ways of how to do that. It could be tradable uh, import allowance or it could be an, an import duty. I think the commission still has to decide. So we need to move from theory to uh, practice. That's uh, that's one step. And, and the second thing, of course, above all, we need a political will to indeed live up to the Paris Agreement. I think that a bit to my surprise, when the COVID pandemic started, I was a bit concerned about, uh, let's say, the Green Deal. Let's say overall, I, th- I think the support is, is still well, pretty high. That it's widely accepted that, uh, of course, there are fringes in, in society and politics, and that, that, that is about that. There's wide support for, the, for this change uh, to make the economy and society more sustainable. In that sense, so, but you need the political will to do it. That without that, uh, we can have any uh, system or in place or any instrument in place, but it yeah, won't be effective. But like we have seen in the emission trade for the last, let's say, 20 years, where I think the, the CO2 prices are way too low. And we have too many exceptions. Carbon, uh, the carbon leakage list is very long, including the steel industry, frozen potatoes, and others. So we need to get rid of those exemptions. 
but I, in that sense, I see the commitment at the European level to reduce the CO2 emissions uh, by 55% in 2030. That's, in fact, pretty ambitious, I think. I, European Parliament is more ambitious, but even 55% is, is ambitious. But that requires the instrument. So, I'm, yeah, it, it will come. One thing I wanted to bring up, and and I know because you mentioned there needs to be political will for these changes to happen, especially in greening the economy. And one of these things that has come up within the last year, especially on the emissions trading system, was that there was a block of predominantly Eastern European countries that were opposed to the ETS in its currently proposed form. And so I wondered, you know, how exactly do you kind of break through this complex difference in economies. I mean, these economies are much more reliant on coal and less green forms of energy. So is there any sort of discussion happening that can sort of break through that? You're pointing to one of the the difficult issues that we have. Therefore, I prefer the word sustainability because that's broader than greening. Sustainability for me means it needs to be in line with the the restrictions on climate and uh, environment. But also it should be in line with a social fair distribution. And this applies to countries, but also within the countries, right? If you look at the energy taxes that are in place, usually the households have a high burden of energy taxes, whereas industry is much lower and agriculture is even even lower than that. Just so the lobbying. But to make this transition, you need to have, again, a notion of fairness. So you can start with households. But if you start with households and do not address the big polluters like the oil refineries or the the airports, or this is sort of, this feels uncomfortable to say the least. Same is true for for the difference between Western Europe and and Eastern Europe. I think there are important differences. Uh, Eastern Europe is much more dependent still on the coal uh, or anyway on fossil fuel. And this leads to heated debate, for example, on the use of gas. Is that a transition technology or not? And the only way out is to have an open and that we need to find a balance in this and that you define sustainability broad to include both environmental and social considerations. And that's that's also part of negotiation. You already seen it. There's a just transition fund, which is intended to do uh, exactly that and to help countries that have a backward position in their uh, in, in terms of sustainability to help those countries. I think it's simply not large enough really to be effective yeah but that's so this will be in a continuing debate and i think that's an important because you need to find you need to strike a balance here well my last question for you might be a difficult one but i wanted to ask you before we go what is your favorite ice cream flavor i'm not such a sweet guy actually so sorry but when i'm in italy which is one of my favorite holidays when i do take ice cream on a hot day i like very much to have two flavors uh, lemon and chocolate Well, now we found out that you're not so much of a a sweets guy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tang. I really appreciate your time today. It was a pleasure getting to talk to you about all of these very, very interesting topics. Of course. My pleasure. And now, coming attractions. Each week, we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now from her home is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief, Janelle Julian. Janelle, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. And Tax Notes Federal. Three PwC practitioners emphasize that via the guilty regime, the TCJA has elevated the importance of the foreign tax credit. Seth Enton maintains that the IRS should respect a check-the-box election for federal transfer tax purposes. In tax notes state, Libin Zhang examines the Section 163J business interest deduction limitation and its exceptions. Timothy Noonan and Emma Savino explore the variety of residency and tax issues that have arisen over the past year as a result of pandemic-related moves. In Tax Notes International, Alexandra Ball examines VAT obligations associated with electronic sales of goods into the EU and the United Kingdom. Franz Van Istendale looks back on the European Union's response to the coronavirus pandemic one year after it began. On the Opinions page, Marie Sapiri examines final regulations defining real property for purposes of like-kind exchanges. Robert Golder examines recent proposals to simplify the OECD's Pillar 1 blueprint and concludes the project will never win U.S. support. You can read all that and a lot more in the pages of Tax Notes Federal, State, and International. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at TaxDo, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, 
you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Analyst Inc. does not provide tax advice or tax preparation services. Nothing in the podcast constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice. A full disclaimer is included in the transcript.